Good morning and welcome to this week's Grow where we gather to recharge, organize, and work here as members of MWEG. We are glad that you're joining us or watching this recording. Uh, today we have Megan Woods, who is our senior director of our nonpartisan route here at MWEG, and she is going to talk to us about valuing um, ideological diversity and what that, what that means and how that might look um, in your personal life and how having those values um, can make you a principled voter uh, as we are coming upon a new election cycle where it's kind of, it's ramping up, it's starting, and then it's really gonna get going here in the fall and next year. So I'm going to turn the time over to Megan. Hey, thank you, Rachel. Uh, like Rachel said, we're talking today about valuing ideological diversity and um, kind of want to start with a, a statement from Henry B. Irene. He said, the children of God have more in common than they have differences, and even the differences can be seen as an opportunity. God will help us see a difference in someone else, not as a source of irritation, but as a contribution. Um, we focus a lot on finding common ground, and finding, you know, common values and that kind of thing. But I, I've been fascinated with this idea that God can help us see the differences as contributions and not irritations. And that's what I want to talk about today. We, um, you know, we talk about diversity with, in terms of ethnicity or race. We talk about it in terms of gender and gender identity and culture and, um, all sorts of things, and we can see the value in all of that, I hope. But today, I, I think it's kind of a different idea to think about valuing, not just acknowledging, but actually valuing the um, political diversity and, is, and the different ways people look at the world. Um, so part of the problem, I think, that we have is that we live in a culture where we have winners and losers and we we view the world through that lens obviously there's the sports analogies where there are definite winners and losers but we also view winners and losers in terms of success like business success and economic success and even education graduations coming up every class will have a valedictorian and they'll also have those who barely graduated or didn't graduate we have winners and losers in our society and that's part of our culture. Um, and, but we also have winners and losers in politics. And obviously, when there's an election, there's a definite winner and a definite loser. And but um, if you think about it, we if somebody wins by three or four percent, we consider that significant, especially on a national level. And um, but that leaves close to half the country who we identify as losers and we try to ignore them then if our person is is in office and that's not really a good way to look at democracy because we are so evenly divided in this country we sometimes politically will want to get rid of our our the losers or, or sometimes we'll we've been taught to view them as our enemy we want to get rid of them by silencing them and we do that in two days we can silence them by winning elections when they're out of power. What they think doesn't matter anymore. But we also want to silence people by having fewer and fewer people who adhere to that competing ideology. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. We want to persuade. We want to help people you know, develop different points of view, especially when we feel very strongly about ours. Um, but at some point, we got to realize that this so-called enemy or opposition is not going anywhere. You know, they're going to be here, and we need to learn how to live together because they're not actually our enemies. <laughs> they're they're people. They're they're our neighbors. They're our friends. They're our family members, and they have value. And um, their ideas have value. So you know, if you know me very well, you know I quote from Arthur Brooks a lot. I really have learned a lot from him about uh, about what he calls contempt, the culture of contempt. Um, he says, you know, we talk about being angry and how that that's, he doesn't think anger is necessarily negative, but he says contempt is negative, um, which he defines as the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of another. 
And this is from Arthur Brooks. He says, contempt is shown through sarcasm, sneering, hostile humor, and worst of all, eye rolling, which is a little, a little act that effectively says you are worthless. Um, okay, so we might not view people as worthless or we don't think we do, but we view their ideas as just absolutely not worth our time to even consider. And contempt on this level can tear it, again, quotes, can tear a country apart. Um, and he said, and, and this is harming more than our nation. Remember that America is a beacon of hope for the rest of the world. And when America is torn apart, we become incapable of living up to the plan for our nation, which is to shine a light for the rest of the world. I thought that was really interesting. We don't I mean, we kind of steer away from the idea of American exceptionalism, but we need to remember that when America is um, uh, when America is losing this this uh, <laughs> my daughter's coming home and distracted me for a second. When America starts to lose this um, idea of getting along with each other and being a light to the world, it affects other countries. And I. Um, the um, philanthropist and rock star Bono um, said that America is an idea. He said, Ireland is a great country, but it's not an idea. Great Britain is a great country, but it's not an idea. And that's how we see you around the world as one of the greatest ideas in human history. So when we talk about America as a light for the rest of the world, we're not talking about because, you know, America is so exceptional. It's because this idea, this idea of democracy, this idea of bringing completely different people from different parts of the world together to live together in, in some kind of a harmony. This is the idea that's the light for the rest of the world. And in our um, American experiment, disagreement is really good because competition is good. It makes us sharper. It makes us stronger. Um, this is, I'm still quoting from Arthur Brooks. Um, but when I started thinking about that, you know, when I have a very strong opinion about something, and somebody challenges my opinion, if I don't act defensively, what it makes me do is, is think, why in the world do I have this opinion? And I'll go and study and I'll learn more about their point of view. I can um, dive into it a little more. And then my opinion becomes more well-rounded. It becomes stronger. If I still feel like I'm right, I, I can justify it better. Or I might be open to having shifting my own views a little bit if if it's needed and so that's kind of the the premise that this disagreement can strengthen us and make us stronger if we um depend on how we respond to it so we talk a lot about civil discourse and civility and and Arthur Brooks says civility is a hopelessly low standard for us as Americans. If we're going to beat the problem of contempt, we are going to need something more radical than civility. We need love. So I was thinking about this. Um, we, we talk about tolerance and civility, which are essential. And those are really good first steps. Um, but tolerance is kind of insufficient. We move from that to love, like Arthur Brooks said. Um, and we, we've learned hopefully through um, MWEG's efforts and peacemaking, we learn to love people with different opinions. We're building bridges, we're building relationships, we're building understanding, and we're learning to appreciate other people's humanity and their divinity. Uh, love is, loving people is really wonderful, but if I love somebody and continue to really hate their ideas and their viewpoints, civility becomes really stunted and the love is incomplete. So I need to expand from tolerating their ideas to actually appreciating and valuing their ideas, even when I disagree. I was thinking about this in terms of building intellectual bridges, building intellectual relationships, ideas to ideas. Now, I want to clarify here, I'm not talking religiously. Um, I'm not suggesting we embrace sin like racism, which is a sin. Um, I'm talking about political diversity, different ways of viewing the economy, different what with policy proposals, those kinds of things. And sometimes, all the time, really, we mistake our politics for our faith and our faith for our politics so that we feel like we're sinning when we allow somebody to disagree with us. That's not what I'm talking about here at all. Um, I had, in high school, I had a really excellent um, history teacher, American history, uh, named Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman taught us that, in his view, 
in his opinion, it was a really healthy thing for a country to not to have um, a variety of people in power, like from for one party to be as president for too long um, would hurt us. He liked to he thought it was best to have it shift back and forth. And he called it a pendulum that that goes back and forth and creates this balance. If either party's in power for too long, it creates extremism. And he, you know, the political landscape has changed a lot since I was in high school, although 30 years ago. But um, I like Mr. Westerman's idea of uh, the pendulum and the balance. And um, we all know from at church, every election season, we hear the letter from the first presidency says principles compatible with the gospel may be found in various political parties. Um, we just need to recognize that. That And I'm mostly talking about major parties in America, but not only the major parties, other parties all have some good and they all have some bad. Um, I am speaking, I usually speak in really general terms, going to be a little more blunt for a minute. For a couple of generations, a lot of members of the church have felt that the Republican Party platform lines up with gospel principles. Um, and so it's easy for us to, when we say, you know, when we try to tell people to recognize principles compatible with gospel are found in other parties to say, yeah, you know, like telling Republicans to let it go. <laughs> but in the last 10 years, I have been in a lot of situations where Democrats and left-leaning people have said to me that they cannot believe any active member of the church could still vote for a Republican. And, um, that is also something we need to let go. Whichever side we're on, we need to really shift our views to allow people to be faithful and following gospel principles and see principles of the gospel in their party that they choose. Um, so that's that's a lot easier said than done. Um, so my teacher, Mr. Westerman, described um, the balance between the parties as a pendulum, and I have been thinking of it more as a tug of war. Um, but the, the, where I, we have this very healthy tension between parties and ideas, and we want to keep it tight and keep it taut, and that's the rope, and that's when democracy is really healthy. If one side becomes much stronger and the other side, you know, gives up, then the rope collapses into the mud. And so we have these opposing viewpoints, whether in parties or just ideas that as against each other, it actually makes the democracy stronger in this tug of war that we have. And there's um, a couple of ways of looking about at diversity as a strength. Um, Heather Cox Richardson, who is a political historian, uh, said that democracies need at least two healthy parties that can hope to win control. So they can't just be, you know, we have a lot of small parties in our country, but we have two healthy ones that have a legitimate chance of winning a lot of power and having a lot of influence. And when we have at least two healthy parties, um, going back to Heather Cox Richardson, she says, they enable opponents of those in power to both channel their opposition while still supporting the government and to act as watchdogs on those in power, preventing corruption and law breaking. So in, in our country, whenever whoever's in the in um, power as the president, the opposing party starts all these investigations into them. They start to double check. Sometimes, well, those are often politically motivated, but they're also a way to act as a watchdog. And they're not necessarily a bad thing that shows that democracy is working and it prevents, it can help to encourage ethics and encourage ethical government when it's done and done right. Um, but there's also this idea that healthy parties can balance ideas. And so we work in activism. And so I was thinking, you know, we have, if we all have the same goal, say reducing crime, everybody, nobody likes crime, right? So we have, but we have what I am calling correlating activism. If you want to reduce crime, there'll be a group of people who are working to improve mental health and improve mental health resources. There will be a group of people who are working with the unhoused or the homeless population and helping them to find help. We're gonna have people working with criminal justice reform 
and people who are working to help police be stronger. And we sometimes will um, think that strengthening police is strengthening police brutality. And that's not what I mean. I mean, strengthening a police force so that they're healthy, so that they work with respect and so that they're respected in their community so that they can do their job. We need police. We also have people who are working on uh, race and racial tension and racism and systemic racism. We have people who are working for stronger family units and more support for those you know, social safety nets. And we also have people working to improve education. So these wide variety of causes, but they're correlating um, and they, they don't compete against each other except in terms of finance, of you know, getting money from the government, but um, they, they build each other and so they're correlating activism. But um, the idea I'm, I'm exploring is that um, opposing activism can also be very healthy. And so I wanted to come up with an idea that, an example that's not too controversial. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about compassionate immigration reform, okay, which is something that we need to have in our country. And so when you start talking about immigration, you have people on one side who are worried about securing our borders. They're worried about order and organization. They're worried about properly vetting immigrants who come in. Um, many of these people are not opposed to immigration, but they want to do it in an orderly way that respects the law and respects our, our country's ability to receive. And then on the other side of the tug of war, you have people who work with immigrants, people who are compassionate and just have these giant hearts who want to advocate for every individual asylum seeker and refugee and you know somebody who's looking for work or for a better life. And I love that we have these two competing sides because it brings, if we could listen to each other, it can, um, it's healthy. This is the way we find a workable solution that actually moves our country forward. The problem with immigration with so many other topics is that we're, instead of listening to each other, we get defensive, we dig in our heels, and then our own positions become more and more extreme instead of finding this middle ground. Um, but my, my point is that these activists are, it's healthy for them to be opposed to each other. It brings balance and keeps our democracy functioning. Okay, have you, I read a book from, I'm not sure how to say her first name. I'm gonna say Danigal G. Young. And I also have a TED talk from her that um, Rachel's gonna post in the comments. But um, she is a political and social psychologist and she studies how our psychological and cultural makeup influences our political views. And I just find her really fascinating, this whole idea. She says that there are different types of people. Some see the people, uh, some people see the world as a safe and good place, and this allows them to be okay with uncertainty and take time to explore and play. And others are acutely aware of threats in their environment, so they prioritize order and predictability over openness and experimentation. So as she was studying, and she a lot of research goes into. Um, her, what she's learning about people, but she's come away with, not with a sense that we are doomed to be divided, but it's up to us to see both sets of traits as necessary and valuable. And she said the, the real problem is that people in power, whether political power or in the media, they have a lot of, they can profit through either power or money um, by um, engendering hate between us by making us fearful of the other side and um, weaponizing these differences, different worldviews uh, against us. Again, you know, so we weaponize them against each other. She asked the question, what would happen if those differences had never been weaponized? And she says, it is liberal inclinations toward openness and flexibility that allow us to cope with uncertainty and explore new paths innovation, scientific discovery, cures for diseases, art that imagines a better world, conservative inclinations toward vigilance, security, tradition, 
those kinds of things motivate us to do what needs to be done for our own protect, protection and stability. Think of the safety of the armed forces, the security of our banking system, the stability of things like jury duty, and also cultural traditions like the 4th of July. These are things that people with more conservative inclinations bring to the world that make our country better. So as we learn to appreciate these different approaches as um, strengths or like President Irene said, um, they're not a source of irritation, but they're a contribution to our country, then we build a stronger democracy. Um, so I, I posed a few questions to my friend. Her name is Rhonda Menlove. Rhonda served in Utah's House of Representatives for many years. And I, I asked her some questions about on this topic and her answers have been edited for length and clarity. That's what the NPR always says. <laughs> so um, I asked her, how did you build relationships in government with people who had different policy agendas? And she told me that when she first campaigned and was first elected to serve, she was actually really naive about the different policy agendas, especially the ones within her own party. And so because she was really new to politics, it was easy to learn because she was always, or it was easy to listen because she was always learning. And so she started out by listening and she started out by listening without judgment. And so as she grew more experienced, she continued to listen without judgment. She had wise mentors who told her that it doesn't cost anything to listen. Listening conveys respect. And it's important not to make quick judgments or commitments to people or to issues, to um, different, forgot the word, lobbyists, that's the word. They, um, sincere listening results in learning. And she said that listening also allowed her to have time to actually study the issues and access reliable information and converse with knowledgeable persons or experts. And so she was building relationships through listening, but she was also learning to become a better and stronger and more effective um, leader. I asked her, how do you build personal relationships with people outside of your political party? And she talked about learning very early on that very intelligent, thoughtful, and well-meaning people exist in all political parties. Um, and they were educated about their positions. And this is something that I think we, we assume a lot that if somebody sees the world differently than we do, they just might, must not understand the issue with the complexity that we understand it. But that's uh, not fair and it's also not true. And so um, she said people who were in both political parties were also committed to serving their constituency. They were really trying their hardest. So um, she learned to see them as good and as trying. She um, learned that consistency in, in, in a way to build trust. And so they, like, I, when we have somebody who we've elected and they have a certain platform that they've campaigned on, and then when they're in office, they leave their party, um, even if it's for noble reasons, a lot of constituents lose trust in them. That's not who they thought they were electing. So there's a consistency that um, that is important, um, Rhonda felt like. I asked her this question. I said, people who are elected to office tend to have really strong opinions. What are the pros and cons of going into office with the strong opinions? We don't elect people who are weak, who are, you know, vacillating between opinions. And um, she, again, she talked about trust. Constituents who know that their government representatives will consistently reflect their opinions and values. They trust their representatives, they'll support them, and they'll defend them. On the other hand, representatives who are too dogmatic, dogmatic, opinionated, or unable to compromise or find reasonable alternatives sometimes block progress and create unnecessary, unsolvable problems. So we want to have somebody who is consistent, but has enough flexibility to, to negotiate and collaborate. And when you are able to negotiate and collaborate, you actually benefit more people than you do when you are too strong and dogmatic in your opinions. Um, she talked about how much maturity it takes to admit defeat. 
or to work for a compromise when you feel very strongly. So I asked her, what benefit did you find to associate, associating with people with different viewpoints? And she again talked about exploring compromise that benefits more people, um, building respect and trust, and allowing other people to change their opinions or allowing yourself to change your opinion. And sometimes when we are too set in our own opinions, we assume somebody else is also that set in their opinions and we are less likely to allow them to change, which is interesting. I asked her, sometimes standing firm is being principled and sometimes it's just being stubborn. How do you tell the difference? And she said, this is one of the most com complex challenges of participating in the process of governing. I have, this is quoting from Rhonda, I have been at times firm based on, upon principles and constituent impact, and sometimes based upon ego or personal feelings of defending what I believe in. And so you have to kind of sort that out. And that's a, a something we all, you know, as we all have opinions, we need to um, figure out whether we're being principled or just stubborn. And she said, it takes time and careful thought. And it's really hard, especially in Utah, we have a very short legislative session and they, the lawmakers aren't together for very much time, but um, you can make it work. You can, as you adjust and, and think about things, you can slow things down. Um, when she said, sometimes it's critical to stand one's ground to protect or defend humans, policies and institutions. And she gave me an example. She's recently worked on a bill. Um, she's not in office anymore, but she's recently worked on a bill that passed this year where it requires uh, public librarians to have background checks and people who volunteer in libraries. This took years to, to, um, to get it to pass, but she was determined because it was critical to her to protect children um, who go to the libraries unaccompanied. But in the meantime, as, as she's um, learning all these different viewpoints, she can understand more the variables and the impacts so that she can slow the process down and so that you have enough study and enough debate. And um, you can only do that when you're listening to somebody who has a different viewpoint from you. Um, so, I would like to, I'm going to have a couple of quotes just from some apostles who have spoken on this. There were Elder Christofferson and President Nelson spoke um, in our recent general conference. But as you start looking, this is not a new topic. Um, finding peace in diversity, in unity, um, something apostles have been speaking about for a long time. So I'm going to quote a couple here. And then if anybody has any comments or questions. Like I said, I'm, these are ideas I'm exploring. I certainly haven't, um, I don't know. I'm not finished exploring them. <laughs> but here's some things President Irene said. He said, pride is the great enemy of unity. And he told a story of when a mild disagreement began as a discussion of what was true, but became a contest about who was right. And we all, you know, when we have opinions and somebody has a different opinion, we feel attacked and we start to defend ourselves instead of um, listening. He said, to be that peacemaker, you need to have the simple faith that as children of God with all our differences, it is likely that in a strong position we take, there will be elements of truth. So I know I'm gonna form, a, I assume, I'm gonna form an opinion based on elements of truth, but I also have to have faith that other people are also children of God and there's gonna be truth in their opinions. Two, um, Elder Christofferson just recently said, unity does not require sameness, but it does require harmony. We can have our hearts knit together in love, be one in faith and doctrine, and still cheer for different teams, disagree on various political issues, debate about goals and the right way to achieve them, and many other such things. But we can never disagree or contend with anger or contempt for one another. I love knowing, you know, we're building Zion. That's our goal. Um, but that Zion that we seek, one heart and one mind, it doesn't require sameness. It's not exactly the same. It requires harmony. 
and believing in each other. And in, in a religious sense, the belief in God unites us, but um, the belief in American democracy can also be uniting in when we are not um, talking in a religious sense. And a couple of uh, statements from President Nelson, just this last conference, he said, I am greatly concerned that so many Many people seem to believe that it is completely acceptable to condemn, malign, and vilify anyone who does not agree with them. Differences of opinion are part of life. I work every day with dedicated servants of the Lord who do not always see an issue the same way. They know I want to hear their ideas and honest feelings about everything we discuss, especially sensitive issues. Um, and he said that when his counselors disagree, they do so with pure love for each other. Neither suggests that he knows best and therefore must rigorously defend his position. Neither evidences the need to compete with the other because each is filled with charity. So as I was studying these um, talks from apostles, the two characteristics that really stood out to me were uh, humility and charity. And those are the two things that can help us um, create a stronger democracy and really build relationships, not only personal on a personal level, but on an intellectual level where we can respect each other's thoughts. And um, I'd love to hear from anybody who has any thoughts on this. Megan, when you were talking about the harmony, um, of, you know, the harmony part of it, um, I always, obviously, because I've done music for a lot of, of my life and I, I think about the harmony in music and I think that when we're in really good harmony, not only can you hear it, but you can feel it. And I think that's the same in, in having these conversations, uh, these peacemaking conversations with other people. And as you're trying to ask questions and find common um, commonality between um, yourself and other people that you can, not only are you going to hear it in the, the discourse and, and the way that you're talking to each other, but you're going to feel that harmony just like you do like with music and 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 it's gonna it's really gonna have this gelling effect you know and so I think I like that that vision of of as we are striving to have harmonious and peaceful conversations and trying to really see the humanity of other people that we're gonna feel it like I think that it's something as you know, faithful women of MWEG that that's something we, we want. We want to be able to, to feel that confirmation of what we're doing and how we're trying really hard to do these things. Um, it's going to, it's going to be like a, a testimony builder of that. The work that we're doing is, is, is good and that, and it's good with God and, and that we can know that, um, through feeling the harmony, right and hearing it so i just i really like that idea um of that and the humility and charity part um you know we we talk about charity is the true love of christ and if we can be charitable to those in our community without any wanting any gain or you know wanting anything it reciprocated back to us um then we really will start to feel this love for other people and humanity. So I just, I just like that. And so thank you for those, those thoughts. It looks like somebody, oh, Brittany, um, go ahead, Brittany. Can you guys hear me? I'm driving. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, I was just thinking this month, I read a book called Rising Out of Hatred. And it documents um, the experience of Derek Black, who was he was like the leader of the white nationalist movement in America back in like early 2000s. Like, even though he was young, he was like going to be the leader of that. Um, but it documents his experience of going to college and meeting these people. Like he became friends with an immigrant from, I think it was from Peru. Um, he became friends with a Jewish man. Um, and uh, he started dating this girl and then found out she was Jewish which was interesting because like his whole life, he had grown up talking about how Jews were such a big threat to America. And then he starts meeting these people. Um, 
but he like wasn't telling them who he was right um he was just forming these friendships and going along and then then the news got out who he was and what he was doing and there was like this big reaction at the school like should we kick him out should we like be really nasty to him or should we allow him to stay here and feel it out and I was just really impressed by the people who continued to be his friends, including like the, the Jewish man who he had become friends with, found out who he was and started inviting him to Shabbat dinners every single Saturday night. Um, and, and like, didn't, it, it didn't even like occur, I don't know, it did occur to him that like, like this was, this could go wrong, you know, but like he, he just trusted more and who this person was that he was he he had a friendship with him and so he had to be good on some degree um and he trusted that and and I almost think that like being involved politically makes that more difficult for me because my opinions I guess have gotten stronger and so it is harder to be like oh I see you as a person and for your goodness despite what you believe um but over time, and it took years, over time, he did change his opinions. Um, and he has since, like, renounced white nationalism on, like, a very public level um, to, uh, I don't know, it was really sad he had to disgrace his family to do that. But um, just, yeah, I just thought it was a great account of seeing that in real life on a very dramatic level. That's awesome, Brittany. And Rachel has already put the link to the book in the comments. So <laughs> we have for anybody who wants to read that. Thank you. Is anybody else on Facebook or anything, Rachel? Okay. Well, that's all I have for today. So thank you, Megan. Thank you for giving us some, some things to think about and, um, you know, some good uh, sources to go and read and and to further our, our thoughts on where do we stand and what, where do we want to place our values and, 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 you know, kind of where are we along that journey um, of being principled citizens and, and good loving citizens towards our fellow men. So um, thank you so much for being um, on the grow today and, and sharing your thoughts. And thanks to those that are joined us live and those who will watch the recording. You can go and watch the recording of this live and past grows um, on the MWAG YouTube channel. And you can subscribe to that and you can get updates to the playlist for the grows. And if you want, you can just start past growth, stick it in your pocket and listen to it similar to like a podcast. So um, there's a lot of good information in, in the growth that we've done over the past few years um, that are available there on YouTube. So um, thanks again, Megan, for being with us. And we look forward to all of you joining us again next week. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel.